Hey guys, it's Ivan. How you doing? Well, I decided to put this video in the RPG Techniques Consortium because what the heck, Anthony put his here. Um, and so this is, and I may put this elsewhere afterwards, I'm not sure. But this is a, a video and it's kind of like a Gathering My Thoughts video after watching the first three out of a series of five, four and five have not been made yet apparently, um, video series by Ron Edwards called Finding D&D. And it's a really interesting series, actually. But I, I want to qualify myself and, and preface all of this and then kind of dive right into to my, my take on it. And, and I've heard some other people's takes on it, not everybody's. Uh, but, you know, I am a self-identifying member of the old school renaissance, an OSR guy. I mean, actually, you can see right, right there on that shelf, you can see, oh, there's first edition and there's some basic and there's World of Greyhawk and a bunch of retro clones. And I think the retro clones keep going and what have you. But you know, but I also have other games. You, you can't see the other shelves, but they're there. Um, anyhow, um, the other, um, I guess, qualifier. I, well, like, there's a few qualifiers. I'm going to talk. I'm going to jump back and forth with my history because I believe it's relevant to what Ron was talking about. Uh, the other qualifier was is there was a time some years ago where I was convinced that Ron Edwards and his ilk were the devil. And it's because people in my group were convinced they were the devil and provided me with, it, you know, you know uh, reasons why. And now I don't believe he's the devil. However, I don't agree with everything he says. I'm certainly not a Ron Edwards yes man. In fact, I just watched a video discussion with him and another game designer uh, the other day, and I disagreed with both of them, you know, violently. <laughs> so I'll have to talk to him then. Tell him where he's wrong. But, so, uh, that, that's, it's just giving you that kind of qualifier. Anyhow. I uh, also, just another qualifier, I, I started playing, and I've talked about this a lot, but I started playing Dungeons and Dragons in 1981, and I, I started playing the Moldvay basic set. That's what I got. It was, you know, one of, in one of the series of basics. And, but very uh, quickly graduated, there's to first edition, Dungeons and Dragons. And after that, it was probably 81 or 82 that I got that, probably, probably 81. After that, I, I got a couple more Dungeons and Dragons, you know, like the, the uh, books, like the Monster Manual 2 and the Fiend Folio. Uh, I couldn't tell you what year those came out, 82, 83 maybe at the latest. Um, and, you know, didn't buy anything else. I was one of those invisible people that Ron Edwards was, was talking about. The, 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 the people that numbered maybe in the tens of thousands, which stopped purchasing D&D products and just played. And... You know, so I instantly resonated with what he was talking about as, as far as that was concerned. Now, he's making this comparison in this series between D&D &D and religion. And so when I first heard that's what he was going to do, I'm like, huh. You know, and my hackles already went up. You know, I was expecting an attack on, on Dungeons and & Dragons. And um, it was not. It, you know, and also, and I really didn't want to go down this road, but I might as well go down this road a little bit. You know, y you can't judge a person by their history. And in the past, Ron has said some things which I found inflammatory. But I tell you what, you go back to the beginning of my YouTube channel and watch, you know, some of my attitude and, and go back, man, go go to RPG Net and find some of the posts I wrote, like, you know, in 2010, 2011, I cringed. Please don't judge me on that. <laughs> People make mellow with age and, and come around to uh, different perspectives and all that kind of stuff. At least, at least I have. And I believe, you know, Ron has uh, become a kinder, gentler version of himself. Anyhow, I digress. So, he's making this comparison between D&D, &D, Dungeons and & Dragons, and more like the history of Dungeons & Dragons. This is where it becomes very interesting to me. And the history of religion. And, the, the you know, he's going to pick on the biggest guy in the room, so he's going to, you know, uh, talk about the history of Christianity. And not just the origin of Christianity, but then talking about like some of the other stuff in America. And I'm not going to go into every single detail of it. That's why you watch the series. And, you know, you don't need to have this one-to-one -one comparison of everything. And, and, you know, not every... You know, when you say something is like something else, it's never going to be perfect. You know, so you can't get hung up on that. And the other thing I found was, was necessary for me was to become emotionally detached from the subject. And just look at it for what he, what he was talking about. And not... You know, a good part of what the the discussion is is talking about this really messy 
history of how Dungeons and Dragons uh, was presented to us. You know, you know, CGA talks about the fact that he'd rather see this talked about from the perspective of the person, the the individual. To me, almost the entire thing was based on the the experience of what Dungeons and Dragons was by the in, the individual and groups of individuals getting together and talking about well, what the hell is this thing we're we're talking about. Um, obviously. Um, and I'm going to ramble on this, so sorry, because my, I didn't write a note or anything like that. This, these are my first thoughts. Um, you know, obviously, if you say the word Dungeons and Dragons now, it means just about nothing, because there have been so many iterations, so many versions of Dungeons and Dragons. And, you know, you say it to a bunch of gamers, and they're all going to have a different idea of what the heck that means. And that's based upon, you know, preferences, experiences, um, the whole gamut. You know, what they've actually been exposed to, what they haven't been exposed to, who they've talked to, who they haven't talked to, you know, blah, 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 the whole nine yards. However, at the same time, you, you can't escape the fact that on a cultural level, which Ron doesn't talk about an awful lot, but on a cultural level, you know, when you talk about role-playing games and the person finally figures out you're talking about, not about World of Warcraft or, you know, any kind of computer junk or whatever, um, but you're actually talking about rolling dice and, you know, make-believe and all that sort of stuff, they're going to equate that instantly with Dungeons & Dragons. And that's just the way it is. Um, I, I think another trap we can fall into emotionally while we're watching this series and, and talking about this is become angry about, like, the way things ought to be. And I can tell you, i got news for you. The average person on the street that doesn't know a damn thing about role-playing games will, nine times out of ten, maybe more than that, I'll give you an example of what happens. Every once in a while, I'll talk to somebody, and the subject will come up that I'm into role-playing games. Sometimes what happens is I'm on that hunt for new blood, because I love playing with new people. And you, you ever have this thing happen where you size somebody up, and you're like, I bet you they might like role-playing games. So you kind of like start talking about, you know, oh yeah, I, I play role-playing games, yada yada, blah blah blah, whatever it happens to be. Um, yeah, confirm <laughs> the heretics. That's right, Brian. And so I'll, I'll mention role-playing games. And so if the person doesn't you know, instantly say something like, oh, you mean like World of Warcraft or Skyrim, which will happen every once in a while, they're going to say, oh, you mean like Dungeons & Dragons? And this happened, I, I can't tell you how many times in the past year this has happened to me. There was one exception. The person said, oh, you mean like Warhammer? And like I was like, well, no, dude, not exactly. But I, I'll give you a 50 XP for having a different answer than everybody else, you know. Uh, so, that's just kind of the way it is. The interesting thing, though, is, you know, CGA had mentioned, well, you know, D&D in that way is kind of like Kleenex. And Anthony, you know, retorted, because we've been talking about this. Um, well, yeah, except, I think it was Anthony said, but, but except Kleenex actually means something. That everybody knows what Kleenex is. You know, when you, you know, Kleenex, like a brand name as opposed to, you know, um, what the hell is that stuff? You know, tissue. <laughs> um, different. You know, because you can't, how do you define it? So that's finding D&D. &D. What the hell is it? What's, where's the origins? And so I found it really neat the way, you know, and I'm going to make somebody mad, so sorry. You know, um, but, you know, you look at the history of Christianity. And I have some experience with Christianity, having gone through a Christian phase and whatnot, and, you know, I'm not anymore. Uh, and that's irrelevant. But there's this whole, um, you know, um, we'll call it theory because that's what it's called. Um, but the JDEP theory, um, you know, the, uh, um, or JEDP, where it's the, the Bible, the text itself, isn't um, from one source. There isn't this, like Ron said, this Ur text, this one place you can go to and say, here's the original word of Dungeons and Dragons or Christianity. There are various texts that got brought together that, you know, even if you read the book of Genesis, they're, they're different accounts of the same story, but they're from different sources. And uh, see, I've already made somebody mad. The point is, there's this there's this history of how, like the early church, um, the the texts, all that kind of stuff, were put together, and you know which you know and and there's lots and lots of um, uh, research and evidence about like the whole history, of the, you know. And I'm not going to go into all that kind of stuff. However, there's the same there's it was a great parallel between you know the introduction of Dungeons and Dragons when I got introduced to D&D &D in 1981 I heard of what Dungeons and Dragons was I heard there was something called Dungeons and Dragons I knew I liked Tolkien you know I you would see something in the newspaper you hear some little uh, you know talk about D&D &D, as the idea well 
it's kind of like playing, you know, you could be a character in a Lord of the Rings or something like that, or play, you know, people in that, and I thought, wow, that's really neat. I was like, I'm a kid, you know, and I liked all that, you know, fantasy stuff and Narnia and everything else, and, but I didn't know what the hell it was. And the text that I originally got introduced to was the Moldvay Basic text. They were in the, uh, there was no game store to go to. It was placed, you know, there's a music store, and they happen to have some gaming stuff. And I think there was another place in, in uh, another town, which might have been a music store. Might, I think it might have been a head shop. And I bought some dice there, like diamond dice, uh, really cool dice. It's the same dice that uh, Jeff Tulanian actually found a whole cache of and, and bought for the box set, uh, set of uh, Astonishing Swordsmen and Sorcerers of Hyperborea. Good stuff. And now you know, they're all gone. You can't get any more. But I digress. You know, and I remember seeing a copy of like Eldritch Wizardry, and I should have bought it just for the hell of it. But there were some, and there were some Judges Guild stuff, and you know, I got this this uh, basic set. You know, started playing it, but my friend said, "Well, you know, that's really just you know, play play A D and D because that's cooler. You know, you don't want to play basic." And so I I don't want to play basic. I didn't want my my friends to judge me for playing basic, even though I thought it was really cool. So I got the advanced, and I, I slogged my way through all the Gygaxian pros and whatnot and the bizarre tables, and everything. And, and I realized right off the bat, well, this is different. There are, there are some incompatibilities with armor class, with how things work. And so I just kind of put the basic book, you know, down. And I played at, you know, first edition Dungeons and & Dragons. It was AD&D. &D. It wasn't first edition. It was just AD&D. &D. I wasn't aware that, you know, I, I think maybe I you know, read something in, in the preface or whatnot that there was this original Dungeons & Dragons before, um, but I didn't care. I was a kid. I, I didn't see any other books. I didn't visibly see a box set or whatnot. I, I didn't go back to the original source. I was ignorant of all this other stuff that was going on uh, in terms of the other stuff that the TSR was releasing. I, you know, I, I bought a couple modules, but just modules never were really my thing. And a lot of times, you know, I didn't have a heck of a lot of money. You know, I'd work and I'd buy music. You know, I bought, bought a bunch of Rush albums, <laughs> all that sort of stuff. You know, bought a bass guitar, bought bass guitar lessons. You know, and, you know, I, I would have liked to have bought some more stuff, but that's just not what I bought. You know, I had prioritized, prioritized where am I going to spend my money on. And I already had the damn books. I could play the game. I didn't need anything else. I got some Dragon magazines. I got some more kind of information that way. And you have to, you have to remember, this is the 1980s. This is, you know, early 1980s. Um, it's funny, like, you know, CGA, and I'm not picking on CGA, I just watched his video today live while he was, he was making it, and, you know, he's talking about the idea, well, he's not that much, Ron Edwards isn't that much older than him, and I'm not sure exactly how old CGA is, but he's not as old as I am, and I think, I think Ron's a little older than me, but not much. Don't tell anybody, but in a month I'll be 50. Maybe not even a month. Uh, anyhow, uh, there is, it's hard to comprehend, and I sound like an old fogey now, just how fast uh, or the world has changed in terms of the sharing and dissemination of information. And, you know, as advanced as the 80s seemed to us at the time, you know, we didn't have, like, the Internet, like, wasn't even a thing. You know, you, you would send, like, a self-addressed stamped envelope, old as dirt, self-addressed stamped envelope. If you want to send something like Dragon Magazine, um, there were other games that I heard of but, I mean, I think I might have seen a copy of Top Secret in a store or something like that, or maybe Traveler. Uh, it wasn't really it wasn't really incredibly interesting. I didn't know anybody who had those games. I didn't know anybody that wanted to play those games. I saw ads for them in the uh, Dragon Magazine. I heard some reference. I read some references to, like, Boot Hill and what have you in the Dungeon Master's Guide. You, can, you have the Boot Hill conversion tables and all that kind of great stuff in Gamma World. I didn't know anybody who played those games. I didn't have access to those games. These are things that I kind of heard of, and I would have bought them, but once again, prioritizing my money. And you couldn't go on the Internet and find this stuff out. You couldn't find somebody who played this game, who knew what the heck it was. You just kind of heard about it. Oh, well, that sounds kind of neat. Doesn't that sound kind of neat, Fred? And you go figure out you know, what friends you could play with. I didn't undergo the satanic panic. Maybe it was because it was Connecticut. Maybe it was because the kind of kids that I hung out with, you know, playing D&D was probably the least of our parents' worries about the crap we were doing, okay, <laughs> at the time. Um, but I'll leave that one alone. Uh, but so that wasn't something that I encountered. But we'll get back to that because that's important. So that was what I what I experienced of D and D. And then you know around 1990, I get married, I have kids, all that sort of stuff. Um, 
and I kind of put the books down because I was busy doing some other stuff and then returned to the hobby later on. Now I returned to the hobby and we're going to call it 2010, somewhere around there. And, you know, what you know, Ron talks about in, I think it might have been Video 3, he talks a lot about the OSR in Video 3 and makes some comparisons to, um, you know, American churches and what have you. Really some, you know, interesting stuff. But I'll tell you what, everything he talked about resonated with me. The, the early history of, of D&D and, and all the stuff that was going on at TSR and all these things he's talking about, you, you can take that the wrong way. To me, it's just interesting stuff. It's all stuff I've heard before. Um, I don't give a rat's behind about what the intent was at TSR, you know, as, as the different regimes took it over. Uh, you know, it, it was obvious that many times that there was a lot of uh, things that were just involved to make money, but that's not important. You know, what, what was going on, what their intent was, what, um, uh, you know, any kind of politics, all that sort of thing. You know, whether they were bad people or not bad people or good people or just misguided people, doesn't matter. What matters is the experience that we had of what D&D was, what the information we were getting from the, the various editions that came out. Because you have to remember, you know, there was original D&D. And then all the little supplement books that still are arguably part of the original D&D, like, like Eldritch Wizardry. Then there's Holmes Basic in 1978 and Advanced D&D, you know, 1977 through 79. So pretty much, you know, 78. The two lines split. You can watch Tim Cass talking about this whole idea where they put the stuff up on a billboard. They're going to make two different games. Why do they make A&D&D? &D? Well, if you believe Tim Cass, it's because they made a lot of money at tournaments and they needed everybody to play the game the same freaking way or to run it the same way because at tournaments before and conventions everybody took this thing called original D&D or just Dungeons and Dragons and played it their own way because the rules were almost indecipherable how the hell does this damn thing work that's that was their urtext and really even that you know is kind of suspect because it, it's hard to tell like how much of this was an idea that Dave Arneson you know showed Gary and then Gary you know whether he stole it or not I don't care. It doesn't matter. We're talking about like what our experience was, what the texts we were exposed to were. So that's that's the that's my experience. Go back to the Molde, the first edition. You know, no orange spines, all that kind of junk. No second edition, because I second edition came out. I kind of knew. I think that it did, but why, why would I buy that? I already have the damn books. Just ignored it. Didn't care. So coming back to the hobby, I'm exposed to this thing called Pathfinder, which was third edition D and D. Just run by a different company. I think I came in right at the point where like 4th edition had happened, so there's wars everywhere. I go on the internet trying to figure out what the hell's going on, and I find this site called Dragon's Foot, which Ron mentions. You know, my ears perk up again. And there, I find my people. I find the, the OSR. I find the people that, you know, remember and revere the game that I used to play. What is the game that I used to play? Well, not Pathfinder, not 4th edition D&D, &D, right? Not this 3rd edition thing they, they kind of clued me into that Pathfinder was based on. Not that. I didn't like those. They were, they were not the game that I remember. But then, as I start to talk to these people more and more, and I was, I was an involved member of, of Dragons for probably a couple of years, and I don't dislike the site. I've just kind of moved on about the things I want to talk about. I've, I've made some great friends at Dragonfoot. Dragonfoot, they're not bad people. But I found out all of a sudden hey, wait a minute, well, these people had all these other experiences of what D&D &D was. And so there's these people that played Menser, which, you know, I, I stopped my little thing right there. As the line split, you know, AD&D &D became first edition and second edition. Dungeons and Dragons, well, that was uh, the uh, basic set, the, the uh, blue, Holmes basic set. Then Tom Mulvey writes, you know, Mulvey, 1981, BX D&D, &D, you know, Mulvey Cook Marsh. Then instantly, in 1983, they redo it in Frank Menser, you know, takes over as, as the lead and does the whole BECMI series. It's two different lines. Two different lines, and I believe it's also just a financial thing. You know, it doesn't matter what the intent was. So now, all of a sudden, I'm talking to various people that are second edition, like, completely, you know, they're, they're the second edition with all the splat books. I didn't even realize that all this stuff had happened. And I didn't understand what the hell they were talking about. I, I find the people that are talking about BECMI and the people that are just OD&D fanatics, and, you know, there's, we're all arguing. There was incredible amounts, and still to this day, if you go to Dragon's Foot, I'm sure you could find just arguments about minutia and all this stuff as they argue about it. It's, it's very much like 
you know, listening to a couple scholars, biblical scholars or, or rabbis or whatever, argue about little points in the text. And, you know, is this fragment or this document, is this, is this the more authentic? Is it, are the Dead Sea Scrolls more authentic than this other thing here? And if the two disagree, which is the real source? You know, instantly, this is making a lot of sense to me. There's a strong parallel here. This is not D&D &D bad. Yeah, and, and I think you have to step away from that emotion. This is, this is just how D&D &D came about. This is D&D &D messy. This is D&D &D like what, what the reality is and what the experience. So I have my own insular experience in here, just like a, you know, a, 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 a one of these, like Ron was talking about, these little isolated little churches, these little pockets of Christianity, um, of religion. Then I get together with all these other people. We all agree that we all love this thing. We get together and we can't agree on what the freaking thing is. And, you know, fortunately, I, I ran into some people that were ex able to explain all the different divisions to me. It all started to make sense. Um, well, I'll say it anyway. You know, I, I agree with Ron that second edition was a complete mess. <laughs> I think he said crap. Um, it, it incorporated a lot of uh, first edition. It took, they, they took all the Gygax out. They took all the charm out of it. And then um, all the splat books and whatnot, which, you know, it's not important what the intent was, but a lot of money, a lot of, a lot of stuff going on. And I remember I read a lot of it, never played it. Read a whole bunch of it because a lot of it was just available online to, to look at. And read tons and tons and tons of all the, you know, and just, it, 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 very serious, dude. Like, it just was uh, incoherent. Um, I can understand what they were doing, but, like, it was just, everything just bolted on one to the other. And See, I'm already making enemies. But the point is, that wasn't the game I remember either. And I remember, I forget, I wish I could remember the guy that said, you know, I, I play B, BXD and D. And I'm like, really? You play that? I went back and really read the stuff. That's my favorite version. <laughs> you know, that's kind of funny. And that's what, like, Lamentations of the Flame Princess is the closest to and whatnot. But this is not Ivan's Preferences video. And, of course, you look over there, all this, this OSR stuff, and I have a, own a fraction of the retro clones out there. I don't want to own them all. I, I found find certain ones interesting. I've grabbed those, and, you know, I, I may be, you know, I'm not sure how much more I add to it, how much more I'm going to do with those at this particular point, but, but I do find it fascinating, and, you know, it, it made perfect sense, you know, because, you know, I, I think if you take it as a criticism, you're taking it the wrong way. It made perfect sense what Ron's talking about, <clears throat> all, all these books that are very, very labors of love, but they are different people's versions of what the... I don't want to say the one true way, but their favorite way, which you might as well come out as the one true way. It's, it's a parallel. It's not, it's not a, um, or some, uh, it, this is like this. It's not exactly, you know, they're not, it's not like it's denominations and this is the one true way, although some people will tell you this is the one true way. Um, but this is their favorite way. This is the, the, the way they think is the most authentic. This reminds them of their, their first girl. You never forget your first girl. Or, uh, girl. It's not St. Pauli girl or something like that, but you never forget your first game. You never forget your first love. And a lot of people come to this hobby or come to D&D &D, and also this hobby. With, and they remember that first game that really, you know, where they finally got it. They got the bug. And maybe maybe their their true love is a different game, but there's still there's something about that where they, you got the bug. And, you know, I can still go back and read, read uh, you know, the, the Mold Day book, and, and you, know, you get the bug all over again. Um, so, you know, I, I, so far in this series, I have found incredibly, um, it rings true. And, you know, as I've talked to various people, and I think, I think my experiences with Dragon's Foot were, you know, the place where I really, you know, got exposed to everything else that happened. Because, you know, I think you have to take into account, as Ron's talking about all these things that are happening in the history, um, you know, I, I've heard many, many people already say, well, that, that wasn't my experience. Well, how could, you experience, how could you have experienced it all? You probably couldn't have. You experienced what you experienced. Then you get together with other people that were around then, and you come start to compare notes. It's like, wait a minute, what what the hell game were you talking about? Or you you use this, or you know, you know, and that's I started smiling recognition. And as Ron talks about that idea that then you, at some point you circle the wagons against you find the common enemy. You know, all these all these you know various people in in different uh, denominations or have different uh, religious, religious ideologies that then find the the one thing that's worse than all that, and they can put aside their differences. And let me tell you something, you know, at, at Dragon's Foot, you know, and, and in the OSR, I'm not picking on them, but we could do that. I, I definitely participated in that, where you, you, you would, you'd find the, the real, the great Satan, the real enemy. You know, if, Dragon's Foot, you know, by the time I got there, 
um, there was something called uh, T E uh, T S N B N. I think it's a the edition that shall not be named, and that's and it was all in cap letters. You couldn't talk about third edition, you know, Pathfinder or whatnot. It was it was the edition that shall not be named, and there was another one that started called the the abomination that shall not be named, and it was fourth edition. And there were like code words for them, but they were that evil. And I think I think the moderators had kind of pretty much at that point there had been so many flame wars by some guy. You know, people going, "Hey, come on, guys, this isn't such a bad game," you know, and boom, you know, you get destroyed, uh, that sort of thing. And you know that also uh, you know, speaks a lot to you know the tribal nature of humans in general. I've, I've got this book on my shelf. I don't think I can see it right now. Uh, maybe I could, but anyhow, it's uh, Carl Sagan and Andrew Ian. Um, and it's it's called Shadows of for Our Forgotten Ancestors, and it, it talks a lot about it's about chimpanzees and humans and about the comparison between them and uh, you know looking at a lot of our behaviors and seeing the the corollaries and things like chimpanzees and it, it talks a lot about tribal behavior and uh, humans are very tribal creatures. It's very easy to have an us versus them attitude. I mean, I you know I, I was thinking about it the other day at work because we we you know where where I work we deal with a a. Um, a contractor, another service, and it's when when um, those people are uh, not living up to our expectations. It's very easy to get this very tribal attitude, this very us versus them attitude with them. And they have this new guy come in uh, the other day, and I, I had this second of disliking the guy. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, why am I disliking him? He seems like a really nice guy. He's just he works for that company. And I'm like, yeah, it, we're hardwired to be tribal, and. So uh, you know it, it, uh, it, it stands to reason, or, or it, make, it makes sense, you know, that we, we do that same kind of thing even with gaming, and so you know we can we can have these tribe this tribal infighting in the OSR, or the one true way until Pathfinder or Fourth Edition or Fifth Edition or something else shows up, or, or you know, God forbid, you know, uh, Vampire the Masquerade, you know, but you know, and you know I, I smile while he's talking about that. I'm thinking, well, what is that Islam? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, probably imperfect analogy, but um, uh, you know, Anthony asked some interesting questions. Uh, you know, at, at uh, in, um, when he was reading like CGA's uh, thing, and it, he uh, let's see if I can find what these questions were because they were really, really important questions. But as he said, I think he said something like, "Is this who we who we are?" And and what does this what does this mean? You know, and I, I mentioned those were really good questions. Let me see if I can actually find those questions. Those are right. Yeah, those are right questions. Yeah, is this who we are? What does this mean? And I think, in a certain, um, to a certain extent, you know, as gamers, because I think the, the big, bigger thing is you have to look at the hobby, look at how, like, not only the outside world sees it, but as we see it. When you conceptualize of whatever game it is, you conceptualize of role playing. You know, uh, when you conceptualize of, it doesn't have to conceptualize of D and D, but your favorite game. So many games have so many different editions, and try and define what these things are. Um, is is tough, you know. Not only you know it's gotten to the point where not only does D and D not mean an awful lot, but like Vampire the Masquerade doesn't necessarily mean an awful lot either, because you have to ask, well, which one are you talking about? Call of Cthulhu. Let's not go there. Let's not talk about Seventh Edition. <laughs> you know, what are you talking about? What you know? Which which one do you mean? Um, there there is a lack of definitive texts, and that's probably just the way the hobby is. Um, so no wonder we have such hard times talking uh, to each other about stuff and, and coming up with definitions and coming coming up with agreements. Um, and what does this all mean? I'm not really sure what the, what all this means. I, I know that it means that these um, talking about the hobby um, can be difficult. Talking about what you really mean can, can be extremely difficult. Um, there is no authority. You know, it would be really nice if there was one place you could go back to and say, "Here, here is the book from the RPG gods that, that you know tells us how things must be done." There's no, uh, there's no real authority, and uh, but I'm interested to see what else Ron says, where he, where else he takes this uh, this analogy. But I haven't found it to be upsetting. I found it to be interesting. I found it to be this really interesting parallel to my experience to, uh, you know, as I was exp exposed to one set of texts, played that game, had my experience with my friends, saw some other people doing some other things, but that, you know, uh, you know, some guy just had like a, a module I didn't have or whatever, or got really into modules. 
you know, kind of going off in my own way, becoming exposed again to something like, what the hell is this? This isn't my religion. You know, running, fighting my people. And then, to my horror, finding out that my people were infighting over all kinds of stuff and really tearing this thing apart and finding, oh my God, there's all these different... Um, different texts, different versions, and they all disagree with each other. And that's in my safe space, you know. And um, and it's how we rally the wagons against other other uh, other people. And uh, I don't know. I, I'm enjoying the series, so I'm gonna shut up now because I'm, I'm rambling. But uh, that's 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 my take on it so far. It's, it's fascinating. So your mileage may vary.